address. It's Second Chronicles. Start with Second Chronicles, chapter thirty-one. Then with Second Chronicles thirty. And now we start with Second Chronicles twenty-nine. To get the full picture, you, you you just can't jump in at verse thirty-one. I mean, chapter thirty-one, because there's a whole theme here. And what the theme is about Hezekiah restoring worship. It's about Hezekiah restoring God's worship. Yes. And what everybody calls worship ain't necessarily worship. Uh -huh. And I'm not throwing shade or criticizing nobody else's ministry. Amen. Amen. You know, some people get upset that people don't never tell you going to hell. Some people get upset because other people don't call you sinners. You know, and they say, you know, if you don't have to be negative to spread the word of God. And I can't tell you anything you don't know already. If you know you're going to hell, you're pretty sure about it. Amen. There's not much I can do to tell you. If, if you were to die today and you're not certain where your soul would be, there's a good chance you're going to hell. Simple as that. Now, you can argue about it, say you don't believe in hell, you say you don't believe in this or that. That's up to you and God. There's a lot of people that say they don't believe in gravity, but if you jump off that Willis Tower, by the time you get to the bottom, gravity will make itself known. Amen. 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 I see people going to lean in that window and lean out over there. That's not, that don't even cross my mind. No. <laughs> I don't trust glass. And I'm not leaning out over this tower with what, a hundred something feet, a hundred something stories to drop. Just, that's not on my bucket list at all. <laughs> so those that keep doing it, just send me the pictures back. God bless you. But I guarantee you, you won't see me here. I'm probably like going up at a parking garage down there and leaning over it. So Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your provision, Lord. We thank you for bringing us through the rains and the storms, Lord. There's so many that are digging out and, and, and throwing away and rebuilding and restarting. And so many now that are even looking at the forecast now that they're going to get more rain. The Lord, that are just fighting with insurance companies and governors being slow to send aid and all the things they got to go through. Lord, we pray for those people that they, they haven't had showers, they haven't had a uh, clean place to sleep. Yes. Lord, yes. They, they, they're just in confusion. All their clothes, everything yes. they own is under water, Lord, and it's just a, a period of shock. Yes. Lord, I pray for all those that are just going through right now, Lord, and I thank you that you kept us. Man. Lord, David said there's but a step between us and death. Yes. And we know that at any moment, Lord, a tragedy can strike either one of us. Amen. And Lord, we pray for those families that are grieving, Lord, and uh, we ask that you be with them and we ask that you touch those, Lord. And those that are grieving, uh, we know there's no time limit on grief, Lord. It's, it's a personal thing. Amen. And there's moments that hit you many years later, that grief yes. may come back, Lord. Yes. But yes. We pray, it, that we thank you for the promise. Amen. The promise that it's sure promise that is secure, yes. that regardless of what we're going through, Lord, we know we have the hope that others don't have, Amen. that our hope is founded in Christ and nothing else, Lord, Amen. our hope is founded in the promise that he said that on that day we will be with him yes. in yes. paradise, yes. and Lord, we pray for those that are battling illness, I pray that you continue to touch flow and heal her, and yes. give her the rest that she needs, yes. and her family and comfort them, Lord, yes. we just pray for everybody that needs us healing touch. We pray for the incarcerated. Lord. Amen. Sometimes people write you off because you're in jail. Lord. Sometimes the Lord sends you to jail to save your life. Well, Lord, to change your habits and change your patterns. Lord, so I thank you that you spared them. Lord, I pray for all my family members that are incarcerated. And for everyone in here that has a family member that's incarcerated, Lord, we pray that you be with them. And we pray that that time be used wisely. That they come out as a new person. A new individual with a new focus and a new plan. And that they'll, they'll change their, their friends, they'll change the, the people that they let influence them, Lord. Amen. That they'll truly use this as a fresh start. Amen. We pray for anybody caught in addiction and, and old habits, Lord. Amen. We pray for deliverance for them. Yes. And Lord, we pray that as saints, we'll be in private when we are in public. Yes. And Lord, we pray that we bring you glory in all that we do and say in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 There's a bishop that preached on Friday night, uh, Bishop George Deal. <laughs> And uh, he's an excellent preacher, and he's a mortician, <laughs> so wow. he, he does both. <laughs> All right, man. And uh, the brother, yeah, the brother, but he preached such a powerful message Amen. that I needed because you know even being in that comedy contest, I was glad the night of it that I was with people 
that do comedy for a living and I held my own. People been doing 20, 30 years I competed against, you know. Even competing against Don Knight's daughter, I, I figured, hey, wow. she didn't make the stage. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I mean, that's not the only thing, but I'm just saying, <laughs> when you get against people that make a living and have been doing this for a living and it's been a hobby, <laughs> you know, and I was able to hold my own. Man. So I was just happy that's to get sure. a medal. All right, that's right. But then, 24 hours later, <laughs> as the dust settled, I began to get frustrated. <laughs> felt like I was ripped off. <laughs> you know, so that I should have scored higher. And that there was greater laughter when I was on stage than when they were on stage. And I had people doubled over and everything. And they just had people snickering. So, you know, as I'm looking at this thing, and then I had to analyze everything. One of the judges was a straight up atheist and didn't want to hear nothing about God. So we didn't click from day one. And he's making religious jokes and all this stuff all during the training in the class. And he was like challenging me. To tell him that, you know, that whether there's a hell or not. Right. And my inclination was, we ain't even got to argue about it. Right. When you get there, right. let me know what it's like. Right. <laughs> you know, but, but I knew he had to judge me on that final day. <laughs> so I let that go. Yeah. And I was telling one of the guys with me, you know, everything in my being wants me to get toe to toe with him. You know, yeah. I grew up playing the dozens, I grew up signifying it, but we called it back in the day. Right. You know, you don't say that to me, and I don't fire back two or three more. You know, I believe in beating you down verbally. And so, you know, and I just wanted to dog it, but I'm a preacher and I'm a minister Amen. and I'm a bishop and a yes, grandfather, so Amen. I couldn't get into all that. Oh, but the flesh wanted to. Amen. But, and then, as I was sitting there, the bishop's message was about who gets the glory. All right. And it got me back in perspective. Amen. I'm mad at these folks that I'm getting upset. Right. So was it for me or was it for God? Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. What am I doing comedy for? What am I searching this for? And I know it's a means of income, but it's a means of witness. Mm -hmm. And it's a means of more things, you know, mm -hmm. and to bring some of the things that I desire in my latter years. Mm -hmm. And But I was getting off focus. Mm -hmm. I was getting off focus on what God called me to do. Mm -hmm. And I was getting so focused in the study of their methods and studying mm -hmm. their ways and becoming what they are when God has called me to be who I am. Right. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. and sometimes you get too much teaching mm -hmm. on how to be what you're not. Yeah. And you got to go back to what God has called you to be. Yeah. And they all, you got to memorize your set. You got to be this. And I'm sitting there, you know, one guy, I've heard him do the same six, set six times. Just in a month and a half, I know it. Amen. I can say most of it word for word. Amen. You know, because I got the kind of memory for jokes. And so they was they were judging him highly. Mm -hmm. He was one of the four finalists. Mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, this is the same joke you told on Thursday, Thursday Friday, Friday, and Saturday. Yeah. And you told it when we were in Nashville. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know? So I'm just saying, twice in Nashville. So I've heard this joke like five times that I know of. And did bits of it while we were in class. And they act like this is the first time he told it. I'm like, man, you know. But I let all that go. But as Bishop Deal was preaching about, when you worship, Mm -hmm. Who gets the glory? Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you praise, who gets the glory? Yeah. Come on so are you doing it to be seen by people? Well, and you in the choir to be seen? Are you a praise dancer to be seen? Okay. Are you a preacher to be seen? Yeah. Are you a deacon to be seen? The bottom line is, who gets the glory? Right? And sometimes we get more worried about the glory than the God that the glory goes to. And so it got me back on focus. And then... Right. Steve uh, Spears, I think his name, no, not Spears, I'm going to mess his name up, but he was from the Missionary Baptist Church in Chicago, mm -hmm. and his brother came and preached Saturday, mm -hmm. and that brother preached about the man in the tombs, All right. which is one of my favorite verses, mm -hmm. you know, in scripture, about how you just run around crazy, right? and, and craziness to have you among people that you don't know, and people that you... You among dead people. You're hanging around people in the graveyard because mm -hmm. graveyard people don't complain. Right. And graveyard people don't tell you that you out of pocket. Yeah. Graveyard people don't tell you you drink too much, you smoke too much, or you're not right. You can be in the graveyard all day and ain't nobody gonna comment on what you wear. Ain't nobody gonna comment on your hair. You know, so when you get to hanging around dead folk, don't expect life around dead folk. Yeah. 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 Jesus asked him at the tomb, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And that's what you got. So don't look to a dead world for God's glory. Amen. You know, I look at these so-called Christian comedians that do all this profanity. Mm -hmm. And the Bible's very clear. Let no unwholesome communication come out your mouth. That's right. 
That's straight up. People talking about I slipped and you don't know. But see, if you slip, what did you have at the surface? Right. If it's at the surface, it wasn't a slipping. Mm -hmm. It right. was just uh, coming out. Right. You've been putting a brake on it. Mm -hmm. But once you got mad, that brake was lifted. Yes. All right. All right. And you all, you know, you got to have the right words and say that that's one thing. But if you love God, uh -huh. those words are always pure words. Pure words. That's right. Just the way that's you right. like. I mean, I cannot cuss now. I, they, oh, Lord, no. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If I were permitted to cuss, <laughs> there'd be some lively sermons up in here. <laughs> but God has taken that out of me. It was so much a part of my being. That all my thoughts were in profanity. All my utterances were in profanity. So when God cleaned up my life, he took all that out. I have nieces and nephews that have never seen me curse. You know, I, I've been in this thing since 1992. Uh -huh. That's right. So those that were not of age and from 92 on, they've never seen me drink or curse. Amen. Amen. And those of y'all that go back, we don't want to talk about it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, don't, don't even speak of it. <laughs> but I'm just saying, when God came into my life and changed my life, Amen. then I put the Paul said I put the childish things behind, right. pressing on towards the goal Amen. of that which he called me for. So I'm moving on. Amen. 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 I ran into a child, I mean a high school friend there yesterday. All hugging on me and stuff, you know. I ain't seen the brother in a while. I didn't know who he was. It took me to the end of the sermon before I knew who he was. But uh, we got to talking about the old days and laughing and stuff, you know. I seen his brothers on the cane and using the scooter and all this other stuff. I remember us drinking wine and stuff in front of East High and living the good life. See, the good life is caught up with him. Cause he went into drugs and all that, and I did. Right. By the grace of God, I always had jobs where I had to take a urine test. All right. Maybe I would have been a drug addict if it wasn't for, you know, the CDLs yeah. and stuff. Amen. You can't come in there with nothing. You, you know, alcohol or nothing. I remember I, I left the Legion home at 4 o'clock. Went got that truck at 5 o'clock. Wow. Drove as far as the Highway 126 at <laughs> Plainfield. Pulled over that Ace Hardware with that restaurant <laughs> and take a four hour nap. Oh, wow. The man talking about, where you at? They waiting on you in Decatur. Man, that traffic was backed up. <laughs> oh. I got stuck behind a farmer. <laughs> you know, this straight up lying. I, mean, I you know, literally I was drunk. That's what I got in that truck. I was. I was so drunk in that truck, I, I just look at the grace of God that I didn't hurt anybody. And nothing happened. I mean, I was leaning out the window throwing up, you know, oh, you know, wow. you get up when you ain't through it every day, yes. <laughs> you know, and I mean, I'm trying to hold on the wheel and see which way I'm going, wow. <laughs> you know? I'm just saying, it was by the grace of God that I did, that I'm here today, Amen. it really is, Amen. and I thank God I didn't harm anybody, Amen. You know? and he kept me in my foot, you know, he kept me when I didn't keep myself, Amen. so when I tell thank people you can quit drinking, I tell people you can give that up, I know what he's done for me, All right. you know, I gave up cigarettes, Amen. you know, I know. I was up to a pack a day. Amen. You know? But I'm just saying, I know what I went through. And so these things he's taken out of my life, when I tell you he can take them out of your life, he can do it. He can do it. He can do it. It doesn't matter where. You have to desire for God to clean it too. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Second Chronicles 29, Hezekiah purifies the temple. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, and the daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. In the first month of the first year of his reign, he opened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites, assembled them in the square on the east side. And he said, listen to me, Levites, consecrate yourselves. Now, consecrate the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove all the defilement from your sanctuary. Our parents were unfaithful. They did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Our God forsook him. He turned their faces away from the Lord's dwelling place and turned their backs on him. So sometimes things are not going right in your life because God is secondary in your life. Uh -huh. The cares of the world, the allure of the world, get you caught up. Hezekiah's first goal was to purify the temple, meaning the building, the grounds, and the people. You have to get right. There's no shortcuts in sanctification. Amen. It's an orderly process. Amen. People don't realize that. Uh, yesterday, uh, Elder 
David, I mean Elder Greg, Nelson Greg, uh -huh. got an award. Uh -huh. And I never really talked to him. Every time I went to Mount Olive, he just nodded and smiled. Yeah. We yeah. never had a conversation yeah. all the years. He never talked to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a chance to hear him. And the brother was such a humble bit. He, yeah. And he was ready to cry yeah. because he got an award. Yeah. And he was saying, I never asked for this. I never expected this. I never looked for this. Mm -hmm. okay. And you could tell he was speaking his heart. Yeah. He was really genuinely overwhelmed that somebody yeah. singled him out and gave him an award. Yeah. You know, and I've gotten so many awards here and there. You kind of, you know, you ain't as impressed as somebody that never gets an award. That's right. That's right. And to hear his heart, and, and yeah. then even to hear his wife. Talking about us, when she met him, she didn't even like him. Right. <laughs> this was the speech she gave before he got his award. <laughs> he wasn't the type of man I wanted, and he wasn't that. I'm like, well, when we get to the part where you know your husband. <laughs> <laughs> she, she went about, about five minutes talking about how he was lunch she was looking for and all that, you know, everything. But then she went to talking about what a good man he was, yeah. and uh, a good provider he was, yes, and a good yeah. husband he was. Yes, and so she backed up the testimony of what the award was saying. Yes. And then he was talking about how he was a bishop in his last, and she was saying he moved over there, you know, gradually. Mm -hmm. Right. He spent one night, he spent another night. She said she brought clothes for a night. Then she brought clothes for two nights. Mm -hmm. And then she said it was four years <laughs> before they got out. <laughs> Just a clothes at a time. They, they, they ended up being there within four years. Oh, and then they yeah. said when his last week, when they put him in hospice, yeah. right. he took the family back home and he went back. Mm -hmm. right. And he said, the doctors told him, ain't no need you being here, go home and rest. Mm -hmm. And he was just saying, no, nah, this is my father, my friend. You know, I gotta be here. And he said he stayed there until he took his last. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's what a faithful yeah, man does. Faithful. That's what a sanctified man does. And this man didn't get any credit. Some people was asking, what did he want from the bishop? What was he trying to get from the bishop? And all that, you know, people that don't know him, they may have thought something like that. You know, he trying to get the pastor. What is he trying to get? But this is a man that was humble and sanctified in the Lord. That he's not looking for the glory. He said he had been serving with him since 1966. Yeah. You know, I had talked to David uh, uh, Smith, and he told me he had been with him since he was 18, or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. before he went to the church with Mark. Mm -hmm. And he had served him all those years. Yeah. But he had some good armor bearers yeah. that were there through the years. Yeah. But what causes the good armor bearers is good sanctification. Woo! Yeah. When you walk with God, people want to serve God with you. Yeah. When you have a godly life, people want to see the God you have. Yeah. So when Hezekiah called these people together and said, get the temple together. Yeah. He wasn't talking about just buildings. He was talking about the people. Amen. Get yourself together. Amen. Consecrate everything All in right. here. Amen. So verse 7, Amen. they also shut the doors of the portico and put out the lamps. They did not burn incense and pre present any birth, burnt offerings at the sanctuary to the God of Israel. Therefore the anger of the Lord has fallen on Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of dread and horror and scorn. And as you can see with your own eyes, this is why our fathers have fallen by the sword and why our sin, our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity. Mm -hmm. Now I intend to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. My sons, do not neglect now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him and serve, to minister before him and to burn incense. The violence in our country is due to a shutting out of God. Yes, that's right. That's right. The country ba brags about being a free country. Mm -hmm. But they don't know they're moments away from captivity. Oh. People tell you that it's an inner city problem. Mm -hmm. The people tell you that it's an urban problem, mm -hmm. which is cold for it's a Latino and black problem. Mm -hmm. So they don't worry about it. But death is in every community. Gangs are in every community. Drugs are in every community. Amen. You got some lily white places of Connecticut where people are strung out on crack. Yep. There's no minorities nowhere near them. They have some of the highest crack problems in this country. So don't don't tell me it's an urban problem. I was reading in the paper where a man was in Florida and two ATT A and T and T trucks was in front of his driveway, and he was upset about the driveway. He took a 357 out there and shot the tires off of the trucks, which was just crazy. If you're upset about them being in front of your driveway when you disabled the tires, they definitely wasn't leaving. Right. <laughs> I don't know what his problem was. You could have waved the 357 and told him to move. But his solution was to shoot the tires because he was sick of the trucks in front of his driveway. And so when the police came, he said he went bananas. He don't know why he did it. You know, this is crazy. This country is just crazy. People are doing stupid stuff. 
just stupid for the sake of being stupid. And the reason they're showing all this madness is because they're not honoring God. The lack of God in your life. Amen. When people make decisions without God in their life, Come on. those decisions can be fatal. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Those decisions can get other people caught up. Yeah. You've got to make your decisions based on what does God say? Amen. What does God do? What does God require of me? Amen. Now look I told you, he don't he don't ask a lot for you. He don't. You don't love God, love mercy, and act just you know, that's basically all he has. <laughs> so then, the, then these Levites set to work from the Korahites, the Malite, the son of Amashai, and Joel, and the Reza, and all the way down the line, the descendants from the descendants. Mm -hmm. And went in verse 15, and when they had assembled their fellow Levites and consecrated themselves, they went in to purify the temple of the Lord. And as the king had ordered, following the word of the Lord, the priests went into the sanctuary of the Lord to purify it. They brought out in the courtyard of the Lord's temple everything unclean they found in the temple of the Lord. Amen. The Levites took it and carried it to the Kidron Valley. Uh -huh. See, don't miss this. Amen. The Levites went into the temple Amen. and brought out every unclean thing in the temple. Amen. Amen. See, Woo, don't get it. Yeah, oh, yeah. The Levites went into the temple and brought out every unclean thing that is in the temple. If you don't bring out every clean, unclean thing out of your temple, you can't sanctify yourself under God. God can't use you till you get a clean temple. Until you purify the temple of God. You gotta purify your deeds. You gotta purify your thoughts. You gotta purify your actions. You gotta purify how you treat people. Amen. You gotta get rid of lust and greed yeah. and all these things that well up in everybody. Amen. That's I ain't saying I right. That's right. Like I told you, I had to check myself. Amen. But I was starting to get ticked off about this thing. <laughs> and I was all pleasant and saying congratulations to little things to people on Facebook. But I was thinking these people ripped me off. <laughs> but then I had to let it go. Yeah. What am I in it for? That's right. Who gets the glory? That's if right. I would have got the trophy, what I got? It? Oh, I got it made now. Right, right. I ain't got to do nothing else. I'm the man. Right, right. There's one group somewhere that said they give the trophy to somebody. Yes, I used to tell Tracy Fields, you know, we could have a barbecue contest with me and you. When we give out a trophy, we say we won the Everlasting Word Barbecue Contest. Right. We can put that on our sign. Award winning barbecue. Right. That's not a lot. That's basically, it doesn't matter who gives you the award. <laughs> General's been selling trophies as long as I can remember. <laughs> you, can go down there. you can go down there and get more, right? Tell them, hook me up. Big loving cup that talk. Right. First place at the barbecue, the annual first barbecue of Everlasting Word Church. Amen. Me, Dave, and Deacon. I won. You know what I mean. But anyway, <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> but I'm just saying. Amen. Trophies and stuff mean nothing. But you got to get rid of the unclean things. In your Amen. Life. Amen. People keep telling me, now, nah, Bishop, you don't understand. Amen. No, Bishop, I got to do it this way. I gotta be who I am. I gotta be real. I gotta keep it real. Every so often, I have to cleanse my Facebook. Amen. People sending me pictures of big butt girls, eighteen inch waist. That's more of a deformity than a turn on the beach. If you got a fifty something, a twenty something waist girl, there's something wrong with you. It was just me personally. That's not a turn on. But anyhow, they, they keep sending me stuff like this. And I know pastors and stuff look at my Facebook. Yeah, that's right. That's so right. many of my nephews and stuff are not on my Facebook because of the stuff they still focus on. The people sending me all these cuss words and, and funny things with a lot of cussing. I had to take one of my own brothers off of Facebook. Amen. But that's easy when one of them's on Facebook. But anyway, <laughs> but the stuff he's sending me is junk. You know, don't send me junk. I got my own struggle trying to keep Amen. my mind pure, trying That's to keep right. myself pure. Exactly. Don't right. send me a bunch of junk that doesn't pertain to anything. That's right. It's not holy. You know, some people, they worship at Facebook. They do. Their whole life is wrapped around Facebook. Yes, Lord. They're ready to jump on folks and fight folks over Facebook. Oh, Facebook. Yes. That's right. They offended you on Facebook. Don't send me pictures of your eggs for breakfast. I don't want to see that. Here's my eggs and the way I scrambled them. Man, come on. 
Yeah. Ain't nothing else going on in your life but scrambled eggs. <laughs> get out there and live a full life. Get out there and do something. Yes. Let somebody else cook the eggs. Yeah. You get out there and live. Yeah. You get out there and do something with your life. Yeah. Oh man, there's, there's an old saying that youth is wasted on young people. That's right. And that is so true. Y'all have no clue about that. The quick recovery tactic. Mm. Yeah. The ability to do stuff mm -hmm. without worrying about a sudden move. Yeah. Mm. Y'all laugh now. Keep on living. <laughs> when you get past 40, you make that quick move to grab somebody. Yeah. Oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> and you like this for the next two or three days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Try to shake that thing out. Yeah. I'd be watering because the room full of big games. <laughs> Patches all over everything. Patches on your patches. You know, I'm just saying. Keep on living. Pastor Nevis used to tell me that back in 92 and I used to laugh. Keep on living. <laughs> That's what he used to say. Now I know what he's talking about. Keep on living. You got to have a plan to step down off of a high place. I remember Deuce Ave Truck when the army was like this tall. I used to just leap over the tailgate, boom, jump down. Don't you know today? <laughs> Thinking about it hurts my hip. Thinking about it hurts my kneecaps. I know that's right. Amen. I, you know, the truck was rolling down the cliff. I had to debate whether or not I'm jumping out of it. <laughs> but I could brace myself and ride it. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I ain't jumping out of nothing, little boy. Amen. I'm telling you. Just keep on living. These are your strongest years, your best year, your best year to gain wealth, your best year to save, to serve the Lord, your best year to get, you know, to buy houses and buy things that matter. And they tell you if an asset is on your body, it's not an asset. Amen. All right. People tell you you got a ten thousand dollar necklace. Go to the jewelry store and tell them give me ten grand. For it. Go to the pawn shop and try to get ten grand. I watch Pawn Stop, Pawn Wars, whatever it's called, all the time. People come in there with something worth 10 grand. Mm -hmm. He talk them down to 2,000, right. 1,600. Wow. He done, well, I got to package it, I got to market it, I got to sell it. Because he know you're desperate. If you come through that door, you try to get money as quick right. as you can. Right. I seen one episode where dude pawned his truck. Wow. He's in Vegas, <laughs> lost his money. Wow. And he came in there and pawned the truck. Man, this is his living. This is how he makes a living. Wow. <laughs> and they took his truck as collateral. Yes, and he wow. went back to the casino. So I don't know how it worked out for him. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'm telling you. And people don't realize that. You paying rent, you paying somebody else's mortgage. You equipping somebody else. I know my, my uncle rented the house next door for over 45 years. He paid that house off for the man. Literally, he bought the house for the man next door. And when he died, his family didn't have any inheritance for that house. So they've been in that house all my life. Wow. He just paid off. The man next door owned the house. Wow. And he was a woodworker. He did all his fine craft. He did all this stuff. That house was hooked up. He did all that by hand. The floors, all the molding, all that stuff he did by hand. And when he died, they had to get out. Yeah. Something like that. Wow. And they began the consecration on the first day of the first month. And by the eighth day of the month, they reached the portico of the Lord. For eight more days, they consecrated the temple of the Lord itself, finishing on the 16th day of the first month. Wow. These people, a couple of weeks mm -hmm. of purifying this. Yes. And they went into King Hezekiah and reported, we have purified the entire temple of the Lord. Mm -hmm. The altar of the burnt offering with all its utensils, the table for setting out the consecrated bread with all its articles. Wow. We have prepared and consecrated all the articles that King Ahaz removed wow. in his unfaithfulness mm -hmm. while he was king. They are now in front of the Lord's altar. Now, a little background, Ahaz was Hezekiah's father. And Ahaz went into the temple and tried to be the priest. He figured he was king, so he could do worship. And when he went in there and stuck out his hand to get worship, the leprosy hit him. And they said the king dwelled outside of the palace for all the rest of his days. He lived in a tent and back of the back. And, and it was funny, as you read the, the text and you look at it, mm -hmm. Hezekiah's reaction was, don't even go into church. <laughs> you don't let this thing alone. So, but then they got caught, carried into captivity, and Assyria was coming down on them, and the troubles got so much, somebody decided it's time to get Lord, get the Lord back in your life. Amen. 
So early the next morning, Hezekiah gathered the city's officials together and went up to the temple of the Lord. And they brought seven bulls and seven rams and seven male lambs and seven male goats for a sin offering for the kingdom and for the sanctuary. And all of Judah and the king commanded the priests and the descendants of Aaron to offer these on the altar of the Lord. So they slaughtered the bulls and the priests took the blood and splashed it against the altar. Next they slaughtered the lamb, the rams and splashed their blood against the altar. And they slaughtered the lambs and splashed their blood against the altar. And the goats for the sin offering they brought before the king in the assembly and they laid their hands on them. And the priests then slaughtered the goats and presented their blood on the altar for the sin offering and atoned for Israel because the king had ordered the burnt offering and the sin offering for all of Israel. And he stationed the Levites in the temple of the Lord with cymbals and harps and lyres in the way prescribed by David and Gad the king's seer and Nathan the prophet. This was commanded by the Lord through his prophets. So the Levites stood ready with David's instruments and the priests with their trumpets. So when they got into the house to praise, well, come on yeah. they used the same instruments that David had used. Yeah. They used the same yeah. instrument that David left for praise and worship. If you look at 1 Samuel, when David died, he gave a good portion of his wealth. He gave a good portion of the things that he owned. He gave it to the priests. He, David paid for the temple uh -huh. that Solomon built. Right. That came out of David's money. David was one that went out there and killed all the people and conquered all the people. <laughs> he gathered the wealth. Amen. So it said here, they took David's instrument. I see these people getting Stradivariuses and stuff from the 1700s and they worth, you know, immeasurable amounts. It's crazy. There's a woman got put off the plane because she had a Stradivarius. I'm not the big one. Uh, like a bass. Cello. Cello. She had a cello in the seat, but she paid for the seat. And they told her she had to move the cello. And the woman said she wasn't putting her cello under the plane. That plane, it was worth too much. They could crack it or break it or whatever. And so they ended up putting her off the plane because she wouldn't surrender it to somebody to sit down. You know, and it's just crazy. That was too bad. That woman said, I better take a greyhound. I ain't giving up my cello. So he stationed these people here with all things. It takes prayer and praise to give God glory. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get caught in the sin of getting busy so much. Uh -huh. You know, for days I can go with just being busy. Uh -huh. And I read my word, I listen to my word on the app. So I get the word in there. But my schedule is getting so tight. Yeah. And I promise to do better next time. Mm -hmm. You keep making that promise in your heart. Okay. Maya Angelou said, when you know better, you do better, right? Mm -hmm. And so... Romans 7, 14 says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual. Sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good as it is. It is no longer I myself who do it, but it's the sin living in me. For I know that the good itself does not dwell in me, that it is in my sinful nature. I have the desire to do what is good, but I can't carry it out. I want to do what's right. But these two things be one. For I did not know the good I want to do, but the evil I do not know, I do not want to do, I do this. I keep on doing it. Right. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, uh -huh. it is no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. Yes. Oh, man. Oh, man. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, mm -hmm. evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. Yes. Yes. But I see another law at work in me, yes. waging war against the law of my mind, and making me prisoner to the law of sin yes. at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Hallelujah. But thanks be to God yes. who delivered me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law. But in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Paul broke that down. Yeah. And the King James is really confusing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> who's what? Who's that? The God of this and the God of that? I remember it took me oh, just to get that, grasp that concept. Mm -hmm. But Paul is saying mm -hmm. he knows the law. Mm -hmm. The law is perfect. Yeah. See, the Ten Commandments are flawless. 
God didn't make commandments that were too hard to follow. Because he sent his son here to follow the Ten Commandments. It said his son lived here for 33 and a half years and didn't break it. So he was flesh like we were. People say, well, he was God's son. No, but he came fully God, fully man. Uh -huh. He was able to serve as God and serve as man. Uh -huh. But he came here to show us that the law was not at fault. That's right. That's right. And then he said the tablets were a problem. Because mm -hmm. when you get to looking at tablets, when you hit those rules, you cover it. Mm -hmm. People get to looking at the top 10 and think they're through. Right, right. When the Jews had 614 laws. Right. So if you want to get into their laws and rules, right. you had to pour water downward over your hands while you were washing your hands mm -hmm. so that the dirt, or, you know, and all this, and you had to do the left hand before the right hand, and they had specific cleansing laws. Mm -hmm. And all this, they had laws for everything. Yeah, you know, yeah. so don't think just because there's a law mm -hmm. that you say. But Paul was saying there's something warm within me. Mm -hmm. I get up in the morning and I want to do the right thing. Right. I get up in the morning, I go to bed at night and say, I'm gonna have a good devotion in the morning. Well, okay. I'm gonna set aside this day to just yeah. get into the word. Yeah. I'm gonna set aside this day just for the Lord. Right. I'm gonna set aside all this. And then he said, There's a thing that happens within me. Yeah. Though I have a good plan when I lay down, but then I might watch TV till two in the morning. Well, come on. Which will cut in on my plan for early rising at five. Uh -huh. Or somebody might call me at 6 when I plan on starting my worship at 6.30. And then whatever they uttered into my ear is keeping me from functioning on what I want to do at 7. Yeah. But then I got to get my coffee and lay my music out and get into everything that I'm ready. And by the time I had that first cup of coffee and my mind gets to wandering other than worship and, well, I need to pay this bill and I got to get this together and I got to do that and I got to plan that and I got to go here. I need to contact this person that, oh, man, is at war with me. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, well, I, I'll listen to the word while I'm driving to my next appointment. Well, I'm navigating the roads. So am I listening? That's right. Or is it just playing in the background? Can I repeat? What the text said. Well, if someone were to ask me a question about the text that I just took in, mm -hmm. could I respond in an affirmative? Mm -hmm. I would have to play it again. Yeah. See, one time, one thing with daily devotionals is a lot of times you read a daily devotional, complete the daily devotional, and take nothing out of it. Because mm -hmm. all you did was read today's word. Right, right. And when you got today's word, what did you get out of it? You just finished the task. Right. But if you don't dig into that task and study that yeah, word, yeah, yeah, yeah. some days you don't have to take everything that's written. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, you could just take one phrase. Mm -hmm. This thing that's worn against me yes. that I can't win against. Mm -hmm. Why can't I win? Because God will not overrule your sinful nature. Yes. If you want to be sinful, he'll let you be sinful. Right. Right. If you want to be weak, he'll let you be weak. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to quit something oh that you want to quit, Preach. he won't force you to quit it. Yes, yes. God won't just hit you with a lightning bolt and kill your smoking. Amen. Hit you with a lightning bolt and kill your drinking. Mm -hmm. Hit you with a lightning bolt and kill your cussing. Amen. He won't hit you with a lightning bolt and kill your fornication. Oh, Lord, don't go there, Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> he said, go out and be fruitful. He <laughs> didn't mean spreading your fruit with all no, kinds of other orchards. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Uh huh. Even this God. Yeah, I ain't gonna say it. Anyway, <laughs> well, we all. They used to tell me back in the day it's better to waste your seed in the belly of a whore than, you know, waste it on the ground. I thought that was biblical. You out fornicating, you doing the right thing. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, that's what the Lord wants you to do. <laughs> the old people, man, they'll, they'll twist things around to justify that sin. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? You see, you got to realize the body of death, if you kill somebody that time, one of the punishments would be that they would strap the dead body to you. And so if the worms were eating his body and his flesh was rotting, those worms would start to eat on your body. And as his body was rotting, your body would start rotting while you were alive. And so that was one of the punishments. So he said, who going to get this dead body off of me? You know, free me from this sin that will eventually eat me up. This sin that will consume me. So you have to think about sin as two, two junkyard dogs. One's a little tougher than the other. And you have two dogs. You have a runt and you have a big dog. Which one gets the food? The big dog, right? right. The little dog gonna get smaller and smaller. He may even starve to death. <laughs>
And that's the way as it was saying, the thing you feed the most will get the biggest. The thing you don't feed will dry up. So if you feed your sin nature, it's going to get strong. If you feed your God nature, it will get strong. You got to make your choice which one you're going to feed. So Hezekiah gave the order to sacrifice the burnt offerings on the altar, and the offering began. Singing to the Lord began, and the comments by the trumpets and the instruments of David, the king of Israel, the whole assembly bowed and worshiped. And while the musicians played, the trumpets sounded, all the all this continued until the sacrifice of the burnt offering was completed. When the offering was finished, the king and everyone present with him knelt down and worshiped. We have too many leaders in this country that are too proud to kneel before God. Amen. They worship money and fame. And all these leaders spend all their time chasing yeah. money and fame. They are power hungry mm -hmm. and Donald Trump didn't invent it. Mm -hmm. It goes all the way back. It's hard to be the incumbent. Amen. We have a governor right now that is paying mm -hmm. to defeat anybody that's against him. He's taking his billions. People are afraid to go against him. People are resigning from the Illinois Senate and the Illinois Congress because they don't want this man campaigning against them with his money. People are sick of him bullying them with Amen. his money. Amen. And the first lady's thing is about bullying. When her husband is the biggest bully in the country. Yeah, right. This man attacks everybody and they say that's good business. Everybody knows Donald's going to go after you. That's a bully. That's a bully yeah. Whether you justify it either way. Yeah. If you you a 10th grader beating up on a 1st grader, just because the 1st grader threw the first punch don't mean you're supposed to beat him down. And that's his mentality. He will attack people weaker than him. He will attack people not able. And he will just go in. Because he has no morals. He has no set values. And all these false prophets that stood there with him and brought them to their church and declared that he's a man of God with liars before God and God will punish them. I've seen them all. Jerry Farwell, uh, Franklin Graham, uh, uh, Robinson, Pat Robinson, all these people. He's a great man of God. They lied before the altar of God. They lied. This man has said himself that he didn't need salvation. This man has said himself he never confessed to Christ. This man said he didn't feel that he had any sins to confess. There was nothing godly about it. But there's people like Rick Warren and Joel Osteen. They had big ministries too. You, you did not see them lining up with them. That's right. These were people that had integrity. That's right. So don't tell me. It's not about Republican. It's not about yes. Democrat. It's selling your soul for fame. Yeah. It's selling your soul to be at the table. Amen. It's selling your faith. Mm -hmm. And that's what the problem with this country is. Amen. There's nobody willing to kneel down and worship God. Right. All this killing in Chicago is because people don't know God. Amen. I remember when people knew God in Chicago. Amen. In my lifetime. You better not say nothing about God. Well. Them old women to beat you to enter your life. They were serious about God. I'm just saying, right there in them same neighborhoods right now, you can leave the keys in your car or whatever with nobody bother you. You could go to the grocery store and walk back home and nobody would rob you. That was right there in Chicago then when people had God. But when they started putting God out of Chicago, Chicago got wide open. You have a godless generation that knows nothing about God raised by a godless generation that knows right, nothing about right. God and the generation before that. You got grandmothers selling drugs with their grandkids yes. and everything else. There's no God in that whole thing. Oh God. And it's not just Chicago. Amen. You can pick the city. So King Hezekiah and his officials ordered the Levites to pray the Lord with the words of David and Asaph the seer. So they sang praises with the gladness and bowed down and worshiped. This is the king. Mm -hmm. Then it says he went on to send out letters to tell everybody, come to the temple and praise. Everybody come and celebrate God. Amen. Hezekiah reinstituted worship. Amen. Hezekiah re reinstituted, you know, every praise. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, you know. Amen. 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 But I'm just saying, Hezekiah was about praise. Amen. It's a prophetic, isn't it? And his name would be Hezekiah. He talks about every praise is dedicated to our God. <laughs> God, I see. God. Amen. Amen. And then in verse 3, it said they had not been able to celebrate in the regular time because enough priests had not consecrated themselves and the people had not assembled in Jerusalem. The plan seemed right both to the king and the whole assembly. They decided to send out a proclamation throughout Israel 
from Beersheba to Dan, calling the people to come to Jerusalem and celebrate the Passover of the Lord. And the, it had not been celebrated in large numbers according to what was written. As the king commanded, couriers went throughout Israel and Judah with letters to the king from his officials which read, People of Israel, return to God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may return to you who are left, who have escaped from the hand of the kings of Assyria. Do not be like your parents and your fellow Israelites who were unfaithful to the Lord, the God of their ancestors, so that he made them an object of horror, as you see. Do not be stiff-necked as your ancestors were. Submit to the Lord. Come to his sanctuary, well, when he has consecrated, which he has consecrated forever. Serve the Lord your God so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. Mm -hmm. If you return to the Lord, then your fellow Israelites and your children will be shown compassion by their captors and will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate, and he will not turn his face from you if you return to him. Yes. That's just such a deep thought. It is. Yes. <laughs> He said, those that are in captive in foreign countries, mm -hmm. that God will touch their captives, yes. their captors, mm -hmm. and tell them to send them back home. Yeah. The reason people are captive around you yeah. is because you've not prayed to God for them to be set free. Okay. Okay. The reason people are captive in your family, they're captive in your, your loved ones, and the people, you, you got an attitude with your boss instead of praying for them. Mm -hmm. You know, prayer will move it more than any oh, yes. attitude. Yeah. Prayer moving right on out of it. Right. They'll find a new job, they'll quit, they'll retire, whatever, but prayer move out of the way. Are you? Yes. Yes. It's hard to hate somebody you're praying for. Yeah. 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 A God will promote you over them and you ain't got to worry about dealing right. with them one way or the other. You make right. the rule. Right. Either way it goes, prayer will move the hand of God. Yes. But he said, as he called all these people together and told them to come in and pray no. so that the captives can be set free. These people in gang infected areas and drugs and death everywhere need to find the compassion of God. They need to get back to God. And people tell you all oh, this preachers market, marching down there every week and they doing all that. That's marching. We used to do that on Cane Street. They'd have the look when all the violence and my right. nephew was killed, we had marches on Cane Street. My other nephew was sitting there cutting up the drugs until after they finished marching. He said, ah, that don't mean nothing. I'm waiting for them to finish. I'm going to get back out there and make my money. That march didn't do nothing but have a little preachers feel good and the masons feel good and they got home before it got too loud. Right. By 10 o'clock, they was home. He was back out there on his business. Didn't affect anything. So I'm just saying, you know, don't, don't let these people fool you with these marches. Right. They angry. They march. The people that are killing are just like, let you keep marching. Mm -hmm. You ain't affected nothing because there wasn't no prayer with those marches. You got five minutes of prayer and 30 minutes of marching. That's not going to get you anywhere. He's saying a large crowd that is assembled in the sanctuary. And then it got so so crowded and so many people they couldn't even get in there. And then it says in the 31, and the king contributed from his own possession, first three, for the morning and the evening burnt offerings, and for the burnt offerings on the Sabbath, and at the new moons and at the appointed festivals, as written in the law of the Lord. He ordered the people living in Jerusalem to give a portion due to priests and the Levites, so they could devote themselves to the law of the Lord. As he stood, as soon as the order went out, the priest generalist he gave. The Israelites generously gave the first fruits of their grain, their new wine, their olive oil, and their honey, and all the fields produced. They brought a great amount of tithe of everything. The people of Israel and Judah, who lived in the towns of Judah, also brought a tithe of their herds and their flocks, and a tithe of the holy things dedicated to the Lord their God. And they piled them in heaps. Mm -hmm. They began doing this in the third month and finished in the seventh month. So these people were given unto the temple of God from the third month to the seventh month. They were piling up stuff and bringing. The house of the Lord had been empty. The house of the Lord had been in disrepair. The house of the Lord had been defiled. There were defilable things they had to carry out and put in the Kindred Valley. They had to clean this place up, re -sacrifice. You know, it had just fell down. But these people were moved by the Spirit of God to bring so much. There was heaps and piles. It's like when Moses told them for the tabernacle, quit giving, we got enough. I've been in and out of churches all my life and I ain't never heard a pastor say it. Don't give no more. This is all we can handle. I've watched them on TV and I've watched them with great ministries and everything else. We got everything we need. They got 40,000 people. We need your offering. If you want to continue to watch us, <laughs> when Janice and I first got into the church, there's his brother in Hawaii. We loved his show every week. We watched him every week from Hawaii. And he was an excellent preacher. 
And he's saying, if y'all don't send me some money, I'm going to be off there. Huh. And we said, oh, man, that's the hill. Get it from somewhere. Yeah. Uh, a couple months later, that brother was gone. I was like, oh, man, we should have said this. Because <laughs> he was an excellent teacher. <laughs> and he said, I'm all right. I'm in Hawaii. And he was like the big sumo wrestlers all around. Baby, we going to be all right. We going to be all right. We live in Hawaii. And he was he's like, he, he wasn't worried about nothing. But man, so if the Lord prompts you to bless somebody, bless him. Amen. Amen. So then it says, when Hezekiah and his officials came and saw the heaps, they praised the Lord and blessed him. His people Israel. Hezekiah asked the priests and the Levites about the heat. And Zara, the chief priest from the family of Zadok, answered, Since the people began to bring their contributions to the temple of the Lord, we have enough to eat and plenty to spare. Amen. Because the Lord has blessed his people. Yeah. And this great amount is left over. Wow. So Hezekiah gave orders to prepare storerooms in the temple of the Lord. And this was done. Yeah. Hmm. They faithfully brought in the contributions, the tithes, and dedicated the gifts. See, see, people got to realize when you bless God, God blesses you. Yes, amen. When you do things that God, God pr prompts you to bless somebody, amen. follow that spirit. Amen. God prompts you to do something for people. You know, I've always wanted to be the place where I, I can have the finances to see somebody struggling amen. in the store and you just pay amen. for their groceries. Amen. So I, you know, just, yeah. you know. You see them, they get ready to put stuff back, and you tell them, no, nah, no. Nah. Yeah, Is that everything you need? Do you yeah. have everything you want? Yeah. Go get the rest of the stuff you yeah. need. Yeah. I mean, to just be able to do that. You yeah. see somebody that needs a car, you just be able to give them a car. Mm -hmm. Amen. You know, I mean, I, I want to be blessed on that level. Right. Not that I will be so high above anybody else or whatever, but I want to be have the resources that I can bless somebody yes. like that Amen. and not look for anything back. No. My dad's desire is just to, you know, you know, like they'd say, who was that mask man? Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was one of my favorite shows yeah. when I was a kid. He ran around with his mask on, the silver yeah. bullet, the silver horse, and nobody Ooh. knew who he was. Man, nobody else ran around with a mask on. Yeah. You know? And people talking about, is this a bandit? No, I'm a good guy. Yeah. But he blessed him, and then he ride away at the end of the show, and they'd say, who was that yeah. mask man? Well, he left his silver bullet. <laughs> he got enough money to leave silver wherever he went. <laughs> Everywhere he went, every week he was leaving silver bullets. Yes. I mean, the vampire didn't have a chance around him. I'm just saying he had silver bullets. Amen. You know? So I'm just thinking about it as he said, what's in your storehouse? Amen. That's, that's Amen. the question I have for you this morning. That's my message. What's in your storehouse? Amen. What are you storing up? What are you storing up? What are you storing up to bless people? Amen. What are you storing up to do God's work with? What are you Amen. storing up? Are you storing up of your energy? Are you storing up of your time? You know, it may not always be finances. Right. Right. Of your wisdom. All right. Can you tell somebody younger than you how they can avoid Amen. something? Amen. God has sent you through all that so you can bless somebody else. Amen. You know, God has given you that. And if you're younger and somebody's trying to tell you they ain't all in your business, right. they're just trying to let you know, I've been there. That's right. I've been there. I gotta tell you, years ago we had these two dogs, rough and ready. And, uh, yeah, and, and one of them, rough, I think, ran over in Cicero's yard. He was an old man that did body work, and uh, he cut his tail off. Wow! And then we come back, we mad because he didn't cut rough's tail off. You know? He said he should have been in my yard. <laughs> But he had no more problem with Ruff. Ruff didn't come over there and mess with his job no more. I think Reddy got the clue because he didn't go over there either. <laughs> Ruff and Reddy went around everybody else's job, but they left Cicero alone. I've been saying. You know? But he, he proved his point. He never raised his tail up and messed with his yard again because he didn't have a tail to raise up when he came back home. Well, I'm just saying, sometimes you've got to go through stuff before God gets you where you want to go. You gotta ask yourself what you went through. What you went through, why did you go through that? Sometimes we think it's just punishment or we think it's just suffering or why me and why God pick it on me, but that's not what it's about. God sent you through what you went through so you could tell somebody else how to come out of it. You had marriage problems, you had whatever. Because when you come out of your marriage problem, you able to tell somebody, oh, we fought that demon. Yes, amen. But we we determined that we're not gonna be defeated by that. Amen. And you know, this thing would be getting healthy again. I really purpose in my heart that I want to be healthy. Amen. And ain't about running around here trying to be cut and look like, you know, Superman. Right. It's yes. about the ability amen. to do what I want my body to do. Amen. If I want to walk five miles, I can do that without amen. fear. Amen. If I want to just enjoy a nice day and walk from, I used to walk from, uh, uh, 
Hammond mm -hmm. to King Street mm -hmm. wow. four or five times a day. Mm -hmm. With me and all my nephews. Mm -hmm. We'd be at one house on Hammond, then we go back over there on wow. King's. Then we go back to Hammond. We go back, you know, just about eight of us. Right. And we do this all day. Walk down to Kmart and North, what is it, North Gate, whatever. Mm -hmm. Kmart is way out there with yeah. Tinseltown. Yeah. We walk out there, then we walk back. I mean, we walk to our squeagle to the drag raceway. Wow. As kids. Wow. We just walked everywhere we went. I rode bicycles. We ride bicycles every week out there. I swiggle. Uh -huh. I was 12 years old for five years. Because under, <laughs> under 12, you get in free. Yeah. <laughs> every year, I was 12 years old. <laughs> I'm just tall for my age. <laughs> but I'm, just, I'm just saying, you know. I'd love to do that again. Yeah, man. Yeah, to, to be physically fit enough to go where you want, do what you want. If your car breaks down, you can walk right. to the gas station. Right. You know, right. I'm just saying. Amen. When I was stationed in Fort Hood, I used to leave the car for Janice and ride my bicycle to work. Amen. And that was what, like five, ten miles each way? And I'm in the hot Texas sun. You ride it back? No, you know, brother couldn't do that thing. Just thinking about it wearing me out. But I'm saying, hey. Oh, you know, yeah. I, I was like, I was 26, you know, big yeah, difference. Right, right. <laughs> 26 to 60 is a lot of difference. There's a whole lot of living in between. <laughs> but that's the point. That's why we're doing this Sunday school. That's why we're doing this study. Amen. Talking about being fully alive. Live your life to the fullest. That means financially. That means health. That means everything. Every resource that God gives you, Amen. live it fully. Everything he's given you, every opportunity he's yes. given you. Yeah. Don't fear the opportunity, walk through the door. Yeah. Yeah. He gave you, he brought you there for such a time as this. Yes. There's other people that could have been there, there's other people that should have been there. But God said, no, this is your opportunity. This is your chance. There's people more gifted, there's people more talented, there's people that can speak better than you, there's people that can write better than you, but God has called you there for this season, for this time, to be his representative. You gotta go there and show them God. You gotta show them how God brings you up when other folks don't. You gotta show them how God gives you glory when other folks don't. But you can stand for the Lord and not lose your testimony. You can stand for the Lord and still be right. You can have a sanctified life. You know, I spent three days in a nightclub with people drinking and party. Didn't even affect me. Not at all. And I was always in the back of my mind wondering what happened if I get in the club. And I'm sitting there watching these people get tipsy and all this stuff, and I'm just looking at them. And you know, when you don't drink and you watch other people get drunk, that is free entertainment. That really is. Uh, yeah, I love you. I've had a good time. Yo, Bishop, you're, you're really funny. No, oh, you the funny one, man. You, you cracking me up. This good, strong Christian is go down. <laughs> oh, man. The Bible is very clear. Don't bring, let anything bring you under its power. Now, it doesn't say you cannot drink. But it says don't get drunk. Some of y'all run that borderline pretty close. It's what you call drunk ain't what other people call drunk. My standard is what the state of Illinois calls drunk. So if you get out there and they tell you to blow in that tube, <laughs> whether you feel you drunk or not, the state of Illinois has a standard. Yo, only had two beers. I never seen anybody arrested didn't have more than two beers. <laughs> right, right. They falling over. When you watch them cop shows, yep. they falling over, can't step and can't yep. say the ABCs. Two beers. That's all I had. Two beers. Man, never said nobody had the more than two beers. Two is the limit. Just two beers. You know, two kegs of beer. Come on, man. Two kegs. Amen. My first point. There are no shortcuts to sanctification. It's an orderly process. You can't, you know. <laughs> I remember people used to try to lay hands on me and give me tongues and try to push me and Mamma. Me and Mamma was standing there like we ain't getting this tongue. Right. We made up our mind. Ain't nobody giving us tongues. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, had, we had too much Baptist and Methodist and all that in us. And these people think it. All that, blah, 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 blah. Like, Come on, man. And, you know, we, we, we supporting each other, denying tongues. <laughs> yeah. And so, we said this one place and the dude laying hands on the and his breath was kicking so bad, I was next to him. <laughs> I watched him, man, I have a boy. <laughs> man, we gave him a few, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and then he looked like he going to move on to me, and I looked at him, and he said, I can tell the spirit told me you ain't going to accept it. 
So I'm gonna move on. Right. All right, you do what you gotta do. I don't know about looking at it that hard or what. By the way, that man don't come over here. <laughs> and then we went other places where people lay hands on you, try to lay you over and all that stuff. Yeah. And I was like, oh, these people are So I was there one time, man, and somebody was praying over a man, well, man, what dropped on me? Uh oh, oh man. <laughs> he took my support system out. <laughs> it was me and him, hold on. So when he dropped him, well, you know, I don't even think he touched him, you know. <laughs> he just dropped him. I was like, oh man. I can stand on my own. You know, I'm on the battlefield for the Lord. Fight <laughs> my battle. <laughs> you know. But I'm just saying, but like, ooh. You go through enough and stuff, and you get enough going on in your life. Ooh, and then, oh, ah, shut up, I'm not And then, and then, just come out. Oh, shut up, I'm Ooh, you know, Lord, you know. This is the tongue moment here. This ain't a prayer moment, this is a tongue moment. Then you come out by tongue. This thing changes by tongue. These demons are for real. You didn't know no demons just got their wings. These demons old demons. You know how I'm saying? He had to show me all that stuff. I didn't believe it was real. I'm just saying. I am full Pentecostal. Amen. Amen. My second point, there has to be a contest. Removal of unclean things in your life. Mm -hmm. You got to consciously yes, remove these things I tell you. I'm telling you, if it don't profit you, it's got to go. Right. Right. Come on. You know what amazes me is that you see people with all these crosses around. Everywhere. Yes. What's that for? People get killed. They get flowers there and all this. And I was riding by Riverside Cemetery and they had a big blow up balloon with a heart on it. And I'm like, you know, I'm looking at what's all that for? That stuff doesn't help anybody. You know, people put all these decorations and all this stuff on graves. Nobody in that grave will Nobody. recognize yeah. so, so. Nobody. So you know, spirit, if you deny them while they were alive, then yeah. don't waste yeah. your time now. Yeah. People go in there to get drunk at graveyards and stuff because that was their boy. Yeah. What does that do? Right. I can stay at home and I don't even see right. it. I can get tore down. I can be in the air. Right, right. right. You know, I'm just saying. This is for the brothers that ain't here. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. For a little bit of, you know, you know, you know some, some of y'all been there. You know, y'all seen Kula High. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's the first time I saw it was Kula High when they poured a little bit out for the brothers yeah. that ain't here. I know brothers be ready to jump on you now. Don't be wasting any good things. <laughs> you know, forget the brothers that ain't here. <laughs> I'm seeing twenty dollars a bottle. What's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, you get jumped off for the brothers that ain't here. <laughs> you gotta deal with the brothers that are here. <laughs> Amen. But I mean, it takes a conscious change of any habit. The only way a habit's gonna change is you have to think about it. And you gotta, you know, until it becomes natural. You have to make yourself do it until it becomes natural. You know? Amen. My last point. My word today is prepare your storehouses. Prepare your storehouses. You need storehouses in anticipation of an abundance. If God drops an abundance on you right now, where are you going to put it? Some people miss that. You expect big blessings, but you've made no preparation for the big blessing. You have a purpose in your heart to receive a big blessing. Some of y'all just want your light bill to pay. Some of y'all want a car no pay. You know, when I purpose in my heart to pay my truck off, you know, I'm going to tell you, when I was able to pay that truck off, that, that was, you know, that 560 a month was rough. If you got a job every week, it wasn't bad. When you ain't got no check coming in, and it's five sixty every month, yeah. and that came up quite frequently. Right. They sending you little love letters. Yeah. We can already take our truck back, so you ain't the devil in the house. Right. Well, if I got to take Reggie up to Kenosha now, y'all ain't getting it. I'll take up to Bishop Mitch's house. Yeah, man, keep an eye on the truck till I come back and get it. You know, you know I'm just saying. Don't, don't put it on the road or nothing, because they looking for it.
good. No, and just, put this behind you, huh? <laughs> you know, that's all of it. Till I, til I work this out. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that's all. Yeah, that's right. But I, mean, but I purpose in my heart that God is going to bless yeah. me. Amen. And the Lord dropped that in my spirit this morning. Amen. To prepare Amen. a storehouse. Yeah. To prepare a storehouse. Pastor yeah. Kyle had to get these storehouses together. Amen. You know, yes, he, he had to clean this stuff out. Yeah. There were so many heaps of blessings. Come on. Yes. So much Come stuff on. is just laying on the ground. Amen. Hezekiah Amen. said, build storehouses. Amen. God has blessed you so much. God has given you so much. God is getting ready to pour so much into you. Start building storehouses. Get in preparation for God for what he's going to release in you. The, the way you think you're going to do it through your business, through your talents, through your gifts, that's not how God works. It ain't through your plan, it's through his plan. When you walk in the abundance of the Lord, when he opens that door, he says your storehouses will be full. Test me and see. If I won't open up the window oh, and feel yourself. Amen. Yes, Lord. Test me. Yeah, man. God is willing to be tested. Amen. God is willing to be tried. Amen. Man, people just don't care. Open up the door. Hezekiah yeah. gave orders to prepare storehouses yeah. in the temple of the Lord. And this was done. Mm. He gave an order. The king spoke. <laughs> Here's a decree from the king. So get your glory together, get your praise together, yeah. and then your storehouse yeah. will come. Yeah. Get your mind and your life yeah. sanctified. Yeah. See, see, there's not many yeah. sanctified church folks no more. Yeah. There's folks that used to be sanctified. Yeah. There's folks that are close to sanctified. Mm -hmm. But sanctification is a lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Just as the temple and everything in it was sanctified through this process, mm -hmm. so you are. Mm -hmm. God can't use you. Because sanctification is set aside for the Lord's right. use. Yeah. But what he does with sanctification, he allows you to use his utensils. Yes. Your body is one of his utensils. Yes. But once you sanctify and dedicate it unto the Lord, you still get the use. Yes. But you belong to the Lord. Yes. Remember, they used to tell us in the army, when you in the army, if you, they could give you an article 15 for hurting yourself, which was a fine and put you in jail and all this stuff, if you hurt yourself. Because it was damaging government property. The only time they couldn't get you if you was on a legal leave or you had finished your service. But if you did anything, a friend of mine went out there, got drunk and fell asleep on a flat rock in Texas. And he got a sunburn. He was totally red all over. And he, it hurt to put his clothes on. And he was peeling the next day. And he just couldn't put a belt on. He couldn't walk. And we had to put these straps to hold our boots up. And he had all that in his boots on. And this dude they told him, if you miss one day, you miss one formation, we're going to put you in jail. Wow. And that dude put towels around and stuff. Right. And he, was that, he was doing his job every day. And as soon as he got off, he lay flat naked on his bed. Mm. <laughs> yeah. He had to do this for like a week until that stuff toughened up. Yeah. But every day he had to get back up and put them clothes back on. Because they told him, boy, yeah. <laughs> if you don't make it, we going to nail you to the wall. Wow. Yeah. And I was going to say because he was sanctified for the government. Right. <laughs> That's all. So y'all take that message this morning. Even when I set aside last night, I went on and bought that ring and stuff by faith. Yeah. Because I know my God's right. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I mean, He knows that's the desire of my heart. It's yeah. not a big thing. You know, it's not a great thing. But it's just the time. Over the years, I kept coming up with other reasons why I didn't buy the ring, why I didn't, you know, this and that. I needed more things. But it's just like the Lord said, it's time to walk in your office. Yeah. It's time to look like a bishop when you go somewhere. It's time to dress like a bishop. You know, even when I was on the stage, I told him, you know, I'm a real bishop with the cross in the pocket. Right. And you know, you know, some folks don't know you got to have the cross in the pocket. You know, a bishop. You know, like I said, tell you know. But that's the thing you got to realize. When God elevates you to a certain level, you got to walk like God's child. You got to act like God's child. You got to talk like God's child. Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen. 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 Look forward to seeing each and every one of you there. And uh, we're going to have testimony to two or three minutes, like at a funeral. <laughs> you know, don't make me come get you until two or three minutes. All right, all right. But uh, because uh, we need to pray for people and everything else to complete the service. So if you got long testimony, write it down and leave it on my desk. <laughs> I'll read over and pray for it. Amen. <laughs> Remember, we are Everlasting Word Church. We are located at 22 North Highland Avenue in Aurora, Illinois, Amen. 60506. Amen. And our service times are Sundays at 11. Amen. Sunday school begins at 10. Amen. We look forward to seeing you then.
Come on out and join us. Amen. 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 Amen.